Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the networking break and the exhibit hall downstairs. Uh, I'm Doug Casa, again, CIO here for DIA, and with me on stage are fellow CIOs in the community working many of the issues that you heard from our speakers this morning and our speakers yesterday. Let's start with some brief introductions. We'll just go right down the line, beginning with you, Mark. Uh, good morning. My name is Mark Chatelain. I am the CIO and director of our information technology organization at NGA. Good morning, everyone. I'm Roger Greenwell. I am DISA's CIO and director of what we refer to as our enterprise integration and innovation team, basically all of the CXO functions uh, within DISA, other than finance, fall under my purview. And so good morning, I'm Jimmy Hall, I'm the Intelligence CIO for State Department and also the director of its uh, innovation office. Good morning all, I uh, hope everyone's doing well. My name is Linnea Jones, I have the pleasure and honor of being the CIO for the Central Intelligence Agency and the director of our Information Technology Enterprise, which is also known as ITE. Good morning, I'm Jennifer Krohn, I'm the deputy CIO of NSA and the deputy director of Capabilities Integration and Planning. All right, well, welcome, thank you. So every year we have this panel, typically, or I should say traditionally, it's been just an ICCIO panel. Many of us, such as Mark, Jennifer, myself, uh, really wear two hats. We're a combat support agency uh, to where we support both the IC and DOD. And we've now extended this panel to also include DISA. So we have Roger Greenwell with us as well. And Jimmy Hall, who also, from State Department, uh, wears multiple hats as well, both within the IC and then on the policy side. While our jobs are similar as CIOs and we work many of the same missions, uh, we also have unique customer sets. And we always thought that this panel was of value particularly to industry so you can see not only where there's a nexus between the missions and the functions that we perform, but also where we're unique and some, where we have some of the same unique challenges uh, that you all are addressing in other customer sets. Since last year when we got together, we've now experienced many other issues around the world, most recently with Israel uh, and the Hamas conflict. Russia-Ukraine loomed large last year. We had a lot of conversation about that. So I wanted to start with that question. Um, and Mark, we'll start with you since last year's conference and what we've observed around the world, uh, particularly the tensions uh, now between China and Taiwan and as those are growing. Can you talk about your role as CIO and how that's evolved? Uh, absolutely. Thanks for the question, Doug. I appreciate it. Um, I, I wish we weren't talking about Russia, Ukraine this year. It would be nice if that was just over and done with. Um, but it, unfortunately, we still have to talk about that because it's, it's an ongoing crisis. Um, so what we've done over the past year is we've really pushed um, the use of commercial imagery and providing for the orchestration and tasking, as our director talked about yesterday. Again, making that uh, collection available to the Ukraine um, uh, services, making it available to our international partners as well, so that they can use that commercial imagery to assess what's going on, um, damage and things like that. And so, again, it's very important that we're able to share that information. And so what we've done is we've increased our collection, increased the amount of commercial imagery collected so we can provide that. But at the same time, again, you've got to do collection and orchestration across the world because we still have other things going on. We had wildfires in Maui. We have uh, the things going on in Israel right now. And you've got to be able to collect those as well without dropping the beat on what's happening in Russia, Ukraine. So again, one of the things we did is we used our protected internet exchange and established uh, unclassified portal when the Kherson Dam over, or the Kokova Dam in Kherson uh, uh, collapsed. So we were able to provide commercial imagery via this protected internet exchange portal to our partners so they could assess where the damage was. Uh, our mission management team has pushed all kinds of information to the globe for access and capability. And then we've begun to evolve what I talked about last year, our joint regional edge node. And uh, again, that's going to solve some of the issues associated with denied, disconnected, and uh, uh, basically uh, enabling our partners in the Pacific to be able to connect uh, any time to the data and be able to reconstitute that data should it uh, uh, find its way out into um, to be destroyed if those data centers are destroyed. And so it's really important that we begin to evolve that as well. National, national, natural disasters, excuse me, um, 
it didn't stop over the past year. We've had, again, I talked about the Maui wildfires. We talked about hurricanes. We've talked about uh, earthquakes and things like that. NGA provided a hurricane viewer, for instance. Um, it was used 1,500 times within a two-month period by 19 different organizations to be able to view where this hurricane was going, the damage that it caused, and things like that. And lastly, um, we've continued to invest what I talked about last year, our common operations release environment, or our core. This really is uh, moving a software development to be able to, to develop applications and deploy them in a, in a real-time environment uh, at the speed of mission. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, thanks. You mentioned NGA's unique role, uh, especially in environmental issues. And like NGA having a unique role in that space, Jimmy, you also have a unique role with State Department and State Department's presence around the world, especially with the ongoing crisis we've, we've seen this year. Can you talk about how your, your organization has evolved and the things you're doing to support those yeah, events? Yeah, yeah sure, Doug. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. So uh, when I arrived at the State Department uh, about 10 months ago, uh, my boss, Assistant Secretary Holmgren, sat me down and gave me sort of a four-pronged charter. Uh, one of those charters was, hey, let's expand our TSSCI connectivity to our embassies, camps, you know, states, stations and posts, right? Um, our bureau, mind you, had been around 77 years, um, but we were not in the position we thought we should be as, in terms of that connectivity at the TSSCI level. And so fast forward to the conflict, uh, we had made some progress on expanding our TSSCI capabilities, and so it's been a game changer. Uh, if you think back to what INR's mission is, it's, it's to deliver and coordinate timely and objective intelligence and to also advance uh, diplomacy. So having that compartment capability has been a game changer from that perspective. And then also we've created a digital dissemination platform that we call Tempo. It's called Tempo 2.0, and it allows our products to be displayed on JWIX, on uh, secret net and also on uh, uh, open net um, enclaves. Now, mind you, you have to have credentials uh, to access the products, but now we're in a situation now where our products are available to our diplomats, our products are available to our policy holders, policy makers, and also to everyone else that may need those uh, uh, data sources. And, and, and we've gotten feedback to this point now that uh, those dissemination platforms have been very helpful to situation awareness, very helpful to decision making. And as our CIO, obviously, that's our role, right, to enable decision-making, enable situation awareness. And we're able to do that from that perspective. And expansion of TSSCI has, has given that game-changer uh, capability for us. So thanks. Yeah, thanks. So we all serve on, on an ICCIO council. And, Roger, you attend those as well, so you're not excluded from it. A lot of what we've been talking about, especially with industry, to mark your point, Jimmy, your point is our operations around the world and everything that we have to support. Um, Ms. Sherman, during your, your briefing this morning, a couple things really resonated with me in terms of the adjectives you used, uh, things like affordable, disposable, scalable, which absolutely applies to how we, we shift our operations around the world. And as, as I think back over the past two and a half years as CIO at DIA, uh, and, and the events that I won't forget that really left a mark uh, in terms of the support that we provide, one was Afghanistan. And uh, this was during the retrograde when we were evacuating everything out. And I remember a uh, officer of ours that was there in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, in my mind, I thought we would just pack up all of our stuff and put it on a plane and leave. Um, it didn't occur to me that we actually blow it up. That's how we get stuff out. Um, and when I look at all of our equipment, you know, and the investments that we make and the budgets that we have, Blowing it up never really occurred to me as, as the uh, first resort of disposing our equipment, which really emphasizes the fact that things must be affordable, right? The second is in, was in Ukraine. So we played a pretty unique role in that in the sense that um, we were the first within there to set up connectivity. That was a requirement from the SecDef, which was to have top secret connectivity for anyone going back into Ukraine. Uh, in terms of having scalable, a scalable infrastructure, we didn't have a lot of time and we didn't have a lot of capacity to ship equipment in. In fact, I remember discussing with our staff, we were going to take a military flight out there and we could have two bags and that was it, two bags to bring all of our equipment that we needed to reestablish connectivity there. And, you know, uh, 
of course, thought to myself, we'll just pay the extra baggage fee, no big deal, like we would do on United. <laughs> uh, but that wasn't an option. So we had to pack everything up and hope for the best. We tested as best as we could. We had two weeks to figure out what the solution was. But the point is, is, is that it needed to be scalable and operate anywhere. We didn't have the luxury of, of testing and uh, fast acquisition process and really getting st something out there that we were confident in. And the, the point that will stick with me in my career was is the, the, the guy that we were sending out there, I knew it was going to take a day or two to get out and set everything up, didn't know how long it would take, but I was staring at our chat capability, wondering when he would come online. Because when he came online, I knew that we had connectivity. And I remember sitting in my office, and there was a green dot that popped up. And I knew that we had connectivity established. And that really talks to the, the future of where we're going. And, and John mentioned it this morning in his remarks, right? I mean, we are operating in a, a very different world, especially with strategic competition. And we don't have the luxury of time like we've had in the past. And so, Roger, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about, from your perspective of DISA, of the cycle times and, and how that acceleration uh, in shorter periods of time has really impacted your role as a CIO and how you're working to get data in particular out to your customers around the world, DISA having a global mission as well. All right, thanks, Doug. So I, I think for DISA is also being a combat support agency, recognizing that a lot of what we're attempting to do is have those capabilities that are ready to go at a moment's notice to be able to, again, you know, advance capabilities. You know, Honorable Sherman was mentioned this morning about, you know, the joint warfighting cloud capability, which, you know, again, a little over a year ago was put out there. How do we take advantage of those contracts and the work that Sharon Woods and her team has done in terms of being able to rapidly award task orders, rapidly get cloud capabilities, whether that's actually in a data center here in, the, in CONUS or be able to take, you know, some form of tactical edge or uh, more regional edge. It's the capabilities that DISA is doing to provide that type of transport that really meets a lot of those mission requirements. You heard some of the other speakers talk about, you know, and I think it was uh, General Henry yesterday that talked about, you know, the joint staff building the applications but needing the infrastructure on which to be able to host that. That's so much of what DISA's core capability is really about. Uh, then you also think about the network itself and do we have the capabilities, the bandwidth to be able to actually support, you know, this insatiable, you know, need for data. And so we're finding ourselves, especially here in light of some of, you know, the conflicts that have occurred, where we've had to increase the size of our pipes. You know, we started back with COVID and having to increase, you know, the capacity at our internet access points in order to support uh, a, you know, more fluent teleworking based organization. But then again, as the conflicts of a car, where do we need to expand bandwidth? You know, we've found that, you know, capabilities at the Pentagon, senior leaders needed additional bandwidth to be able to support all of the data that's coming into them. So again, I think those are some of the key capabilities that we are doing to try to increase, you know, speed, for the actual accomplishment of the mission. Yeah, and we heard earlier, you know, the importance of operating in a, either a disconnected or a degraded environment. And, you know, we, we've talked a lot about connectivity, but it's more than just the connectivity, it's having the data close to you as well. And that, is, that has been a challenge, and I will say that is where we need help from industry, uh, is being able to operate any function from anywhere in the world. We were talking in, internally within uh, our organization last week, trying to characterize how much data we have and what we would need to move around the world in a certain scenario. And someone mentioned that it's the equivalent of what we host you know, out of one of our data centers of five libraries of Congress, right? And so that really characterizes the demand that we have from those that we support. If they need the equivalent of five libraries of Congress whenever, wherever they are in the world. And that is hard to do. And where we're at today, it comes down to a prioritization because the infrastructure is limited in terms of connectivity, you know, and especially denied degraded areas, we have to prioritize what we have. And that's really what the next generation of capabilities will help us figure out is how do we move large quantities of data and processing 
from anywhere in the world that we operate. Cybersecurity, also you've heard, is, is a theme so far throughout this conference, and we talked a lot about that last year. Zero trust and, and uh, the, the pillars associated with zero trust or priority areas also very much related to data. Um, as, we, as we said in the past, traditionally, war has been connected to strikes. Now it's cyber. That's the first strike. Jennifer, obviously, NSA plays a major role in that, really leads the way in, in setting the path for zero trust. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. NSA was established a little over 70 years ago, not quite as long ago as INR, Jimmy, but over 70 years ago, and that's how long we've been doing cybersecurity at NSA. We haven't always called it that. Around World War II and shortly after, it was communication security, then it was computer security, for a long time it was information assurance, now we call it cybersecurity. Now, Doug, as you said, everyone's doing it, but NSA was doing it before it was cool, just so you know. <laughs> hipster cred aside, um, I also want to say that all of those decades of experience and expertise have allowed us to be able to, to lead the way and to help the entire IC, DOD, the federal government, and the defense industrial base as we shift towards zero trust. So one of the ways that we do that from NSA is that the director of NSA is the national manager for national security systems. General Nakasone is a busy guy. He is the director of the National Security Agency. He is the chief of central security services. He's the commander of Cybercom, and he's also the national manager for national security systems. This is a role the NSA director has had since 1990, but it was recently very much augmented when the president signed National Security Memorandum 8 at the beginning of 2021, which directed how all of national security systems need to move to zero trust. National security systems, as you all may know, is defined as not only all of the classified, but also virtually any system operated, but whether it's by the government or a contractor, that it, it really is interrelated in any way with the military or with intelligence. So it's everything that's in NSA and then a lot of what we do across the entirety of the USG. So that's a role that the director of NSA has. Uh, with NSM-8, he now has the power to issue directives and to gather a lot of information from all of those owners. Some of the things that we have been able to do with those uh, new authorities and over the years is we've worked with industry to harden billions of endpoints against active threats. We have issued public guidance about active threats for the public to consume. Uh, we have uh, notified vendors of dozens of zero-day vulnerabilities before they could be exploited, and we've provided NSA-run cybersecurity activities to a number of companies within the DIB. So that's a role that the national manager has for all of the systems that are national security related across the entirety of the U.S. government, but it's incumbent on each individual agency to implement those for itself, and that's where NSA CIO comes in. My office, the NSA CIO, is responsible for ensuring that NSA itself is consistent with these zero trust priorities. And this, again, is something that we've been doing since long before it was called zero trust. But we've been on this journey for quite a while, and it had all of the same hallmarks that we now associate with zero trust, such as assume a hostile environment, assume breach, never trust, always verify, and continuously monitor and audit, it, audit all your systems. We consider all of our systems in NSA to be national security systems, whether they are classified or not. Thanks to all of this work over a number of years, we've been able to achieve a high degree of security and of maturity along the zero trust uh, maturity model. And one of the best things about being at that level is that we've been able to give back, if you will. We've been able to partner with all of our friends across the IC and DOD and in the, the defense industrial base to provide our lessons learned, our best practices to raise the, the tide for all of us because we're only as strong as our weakest link and our adversaries are not going to be resting on their laurels, so we always need to stay a step ahead. So we've really spent a lot of time over the last few years from the NSA perspective, providing guidance and working with our other um, agencies across the IC so that we can all get to that higher level of maturity. Some of our specific best practices that we share, we've implemented a data-centric architecture, and shout out to my friend Lori Wade and her, her um, uh, keynote earlier today. We have fine-grained identity and attribute-based access control, and we continuously monitor and audit all of our systems. So I'm really proud to be part of the agency and representing that agency here that is not only at the forefront of these efforts, but is working with the rest of the community to make sure that we are all far along on our zero trust journey. Thanks, Jennifer. 
One thing I'd like to add with regard to zero trust, a lot of times we think about that in terms of individuals, which is a very important aspect, especially when we talk about the top secret network. Insider threats is a real concern, and really the primary concern uh, when it comes to top secret. Um, but also it is equipment, it's comply to connect. And that is definitely dependent on our investments in technology refresh. Uh, when we think about comply to connect, older equipment not only cannot be patched, but it also does not comply with those standards. And that's where we get at really the importance of having a healthy foundation. I talked a bit yesterday in, in terms of the impacts of sequestration from a decade ago and the, in what that's meant for not only our ability to perform, but the ability to adopt many of these new standards for zero trust. Part of our JWIC's modernization is doing cyber inspections. And an element of that is how well we are moving down the zero trust path. And I will say that is a concern of all agencies, is having that healthy baseline to be able to do, adopt the standards of zero trust, but having a path forward for things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and everything that you've heard, it's all dependent on having that healthy foundational infrastructure. We talk about being bold and what that next bold next step can be, but it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You have to have a healthy base in order to think creatively at the top of the pyramid. Um, as, as we think about cybersecurity um, and, and where we're moving, I, I often think about it as the path of least resistance. And this is going to be the importance of zero trust. Is the ATO process, is, is a, it's a common element that we talk about. There's a lot of friction in it. It's the notion of slowing things down. Where I've seen in zero trust, especially in that comply to connect, is actually reducing friction in a lot of areas. And this is where I see it taking off. And there was an instance this year where um, we were installing a, for our promotion panels, uh, equipment where we needed to set it up in a room. And traditionally, you would have to open up the port. And uh, that would go through the change management process and it would take a long time to do. Now with Comply to Connect and some of the zero trust elements that are in there, we plugged it in and it worked. And honestly, I was amazed, right? Because it's reducing the friction <laughs> of getting things up to speed. And that's how we have to look at it. We spoke a little bit about that this morning as well, of you know, the, the making things usable. Um, and we heard about that on the uh, J2 and J6 panel yesterday with the vacuum example of, of being able to watch YouTube and quickly fixing a vacuum. Uh, and that's, you know, we talk about zero trust in terms of security, but there's a customer element of it as well in terms of usability. Uh, and reducing that friction of air in areas to make us operate faster to the speed of mission. Partnerships is also a big element that we spoke to yesterday. And at the end of the day, we closed it out with our 5 eye panel, which I found very informative. Jimmy, you play a big role, obviously, in partnerships with State Department, uh, both traditional and non-traditional. And we spoke about the, the elements of strategic competition and how that's becoming more and more important as we see events around the world unfold. Can you talk about that as well from a, a State Department perspective and where you sit? Yeah, yeah. thanks again, Doug. So <clears throat> I'm going to be uh, one of those guys that quote uh, Honorable uh, John Sherman as well. So John, no pressure, <laughs> but we all hang on to all your words. Uh, you know. So he talked about uh, urgency and, and teamwork. Right? And so that collective action is, is State Department's mantra, especially in INR. And partnerships is what we do. Diplomacy is what we do. And so it's no surprise that we have to work uh, with our partners. And so intelligence and power and diplomacy is our mantra. We strive for that every day. Uh, we know that intelligence is key to a more peaceful world, a more safer world, a more prosperous world. And we can't get it done alone. And if there's any entity or anyone sitting out saying, hey, we're going to solve world problems and world issues alone, industry and federal government together is a key to success. And so that's how we look at it. And in terms of uh, forums, you know, there are several international forums that we participate in from a State Department perspective that allow us and enable us to be successful. Um, I, I can't say enough about the latest crisis of, of the meetings that, that occur on a daily basis. Uh, folks have seen the Secretary of State uh, travel around the world, and he doesn't do that without the support of IT. He doesn't do that without the support of uh, data, and safeguarding that data is important for us, right? And, and also, at the end of the day, cybersecurity, which Jennifer talked about, is really important to the State Department as well. And I talked about four of the uh, charters that I was given when I, I showed up at State Department. One of them was to strengthen our, our cybersecurity posture. And even though that we've been around 77 years and, and the fact that the, the State Department is an entity that's ingrained in, 
diplomacy, you know, we could get better at it, and we get better at it every day. So we're not at this point where we're not learning uh, those gaps and seams that we see. We're closing them on a daily basis. But it's more connected than just State Department. It's more connected than just the folks on the stage here. It's, it's a world connection. And you talk about a chain being as strong as its uh, weakest link. Yeah, that, that applies to international partners as well. And so we have to get to the point where we overshare, we communicate, and it's about the collective action, it's about the urgency, and it's about teamwork. Thanks. So many of the, the discussions we've had amongst, uh, especially the Five Eye over the past year, have dealt with zero trust. It's dealt with a lot with connectivity, again, being able to operate from anywhere in the world. But then there's also the migration to cloud. And we, we as part of the U.S. side, have kind of been first into that journey over the past uh, almost a decade at this point. Uh, of lessons learned, and we've shared a lot of those amongst uh, our different partners. Uh, Jennifer, Linnea, you both are really leading the way in the IC for that cloud transition. Um, can you talk about the cloud journey and some of those same challenges that we've shared with, with our partners on lessons learned, both you know, positive and negative, uh, as we've moved in, into that space? Yeah. So absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank DIA and thank Doug and EP for having uh, CIA here and for also bringing us together. A lot of times people don't realize that we actually work together day in and day out. Uh, and so it's really more like a family and a partnership together across the government landscape, especially with DOD and the IC. And so couldn't be more happier and more proud to be a part of the team as we go and approach these issues and concerns. Uh, as our colleagues were speaking up here, there's many similarities and much we do in common across the group of us. Um, I think starting out, uh, similar to Jimmy and Jennifer, I feel like everyone knows when their agency was born. <laughs> CIA was born 75 years ago. Uh, this is their 76 years. So last year we celebrated that anniversary. And I think it's also amazing to look at how the agency started and understand kind of what our foundational, whether it be cybersecurity, whether it be SIGINT, whether it be human, GON, uh, or even OSINT. And I think that the beauty of intelligence is for all of us to work together to tell a story collectively. Uh, I call it like a, a beautiful tapestry, if you would, of how we can all integrate together and create the puzzle pieces to actually uh, partner. Partnerships are not just, of course, across the agencies and the elements. Doug, you mentioned about cloud. Uh, more so than ever, uh, yesterday Adele Merritt was speaking about our ICCIO about our cloud journey and uh, very honored and humbled that roughly about 10 years ago, CIA was out front and center and kind of leading that journey on behalf of the IC with our first commercial cloud services program at that time to really help the intelligence community and the U.S. federal government, as Jennifer mentioned, raising the tide for others to help bring us up and and allow industry and partners to really bring those capabilities into the community and provide access to data and information in ways that uh, we hadn't been able to before. You know, it's very, very hard. These problems are too complex for any of us to solve on our own, whether it be agencies or elements or even industry and the government. And I think throughout anything, if anyone takes anyone away, please know that you know, we value the partnerships and without having the partnerships of industry, we may not be able to do the same work in the same means or mode that we can do. Uh, the other aspect, of course, we progressed, learned about cloud from there and kind of really started the journey. And now we're working with, of course, five cloud service providers for commercial cloud enterprise, uh, which was awarded a few years ago. And so it has been a, a great relationship and partnership. And now more than ever, working with Roger uh, and JWCC, as Honorable Sherman mentioned, it's all about how can we work together across the IC and the DOD landscapes to really share that data and information that you speak about, Doug, and actually work together more collectively. And so very excited about the progression of that. I think as we go on, you know, we're learning and gaining access and information, but one of the key areas that a lot of people don't realize is 
by far and large, uh, really up, up until about maybe the last five to seven years, you hear us all speak about the classified networks, the classified networks. That landscape has changed, right? Uh, as Mark was speaking about the joint regional edge nodes, JRENS and NGA has a phenomenal unclassified mission that they share with the defense community and all. I think a lot of people don't realize that, that for us, it's the multi-fabric aspect. Multiple of us will operate, whether it be on the unclassified domain, as Honorable Sherman was talking about as well, uh, be it the secret domain, which is largely used across the defense community as well, uh, and then on the classified. So I think, if anything, we're becoming more agile and able to really adjust uh, to wherever the mission need, and that's critical for the cyber and really to really not just keep pace but outpace our adversaries, which is where we want to be. Thank you, and Jennifer, I know you know NSA. GovCloud for many years as well. Can you speak about that journey? And then Roger, maybe we'll, we'll end that question with you, talking about JWCC and, and the role you've had in that. Linnea started off her comments talking about how we all work together and talk and are on VTCs all day, every day. <laughs> but I also wanted to add, we don't see each other in person that often. So this is actually, uh, so in addition to everything else, Doug, thank you for giving us the opportunity to see each other in person. Sometimes we have to fly across the community to talk to the people who are right across the river. But that's a lot of the value of DOTUS, right? It's a lot of the value of our actually making the trip to come and see each other in person. Uh, in terms of cloud, the key to NSA's multiple cloud architecture and our strategy is the right computing solution for each purpose, the right cloud for each mission. That's the keystone to our multiple cloud architecture, which we've been well on the way on the journey with uh, for a, a number of years right now. We're working with a number of vendors for um, our platforms, and there is an incredible number of opportunities that are going to be opening up over the next few years that I want to chat to you all about for a little bit. Um, for us, the shift of our IT to cloud is all about a couple of things. First, it's leveraging the best of industry, and not just industry writ large, but the specific niche strategic advantages that each company has, and being able to take advantage of that for our mission requirements. It's about getting the most powerful, secure, and efficient platforms that have security built in from the beginning. And to a large extent, it's about getting ourselves, the government, out of the business of managing data centers. That's not what we do best. That's what industry does best. And we want to be able to go to the best player. So that's something that's also motivating our move. So where we are on the journey, uh, so one of our top priorities for NSA CIO over the next year or two is going to be the shift of our IC Gov Cloud, Doug, that you mentioned, off-prem. So it's called IC Gov Cloud, but it hasn't actually been a cloud uh, for most of its existence. It's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, we've been sort of our own cloud service provider. It's been on-prem, but that's changing. That's in the process of changing right now. IC Gov Cloud is the platform by which NSA provides uh, big data analytics. It's a data fusion discovery and analysis platform that is the workhorse of NSA and is also available to and used by all of the rest of the IC as well. And we're moving it off-prem, and that's through our hybrid compute initiative and also what you might know as our wild and stormy contract. So we have contracts with um, AWS and with HPE for that. And so we're going to be focusing on that. It's really going to be opening up what we're able to offer to ourselves, what we can handle for NSA, and also for the rest of the IC. But those are just the big infrastructure, the big platforms. GovCloud itself is constituted of hundreds of different products and services, and many more that we probably could benefit from and we don't even know exist right now. So there's still a lot of opportunity out there. Yesterday, General Barrier had talked about how it's challenging for DIA to be a premier intelligence service when it's got an HR system that was designed in the 1990s. I don't know if NSA's was designed in the 1990s, but I don't think it was too far off. <laughs> and so we're very grateful for our partnership with Oracle, through which we're going to be delivering our human capital management system to have a modernized HG uh, system for our workforce who so deserves it. Um, we can't expect to be a premier intelligence service when we have that. And it's another example of industry is offering a best-in-class solution that we can adopt and adapt. We don't need to design a bespoke NSA-specific system when there is something that industry can provide and that we can take in and adapt. 
Uh, we're also working closely to, with uh, industry to deliver Office 365 to the whole IC. That's something that we're working on with another partner, Microsoft. And then building on what Linnea had said, we are C2S uh, uh, users and we're transitioning to C2E, building on what uh, John and Linnea uh, did to take the um, community from a single vendor to five vendors uh, several years ago. So we're looking forward to that. So for NSA, you, you had asked about sort of opportunities and challenges. For NSA, the benefits are enormous and I, I think pretty obvious. It's reliable platforms, it's fostering faster delivery, um, and being able to focus our government human capital on, the thing, on our mission, the things that we do best. For industry, there's also a lot of benefits, as I had said. We've got uh, a number of contracts with uh, cloud providers that we're already utilizing, and we're planning to only increase that over the coming years. And now is a perfect window of opportunity as we're making this major shift with our IC Gov Cloud. In terms of challenges, uh, one is something that's come up today and also came up quite a bit during the Five Eyes chat yesterday, um, that business systems and policy and in fact our culture really need to keep up with technical innovation and with our shift to the cloud. Um, that's a, a challenge. Um, innovation is not only about technology and innovation is not only about mission systems, it's gotta happen to our business systems too, starting with and not limited to our, our acquisition systems if we're going to be able to adopt cloud. There's also cost issues. Uh, first, cloud enables us to see our total cost of ownership for programs, which can be um, confronting. Uh, a lot of programs have not had to see exactly how much it costs to run those programs because a lot of the infrastructure has been covered by the enterprise, like power, space, and cooling for data centers. So that can sometimes make it seem as if costs are going up when you go to the cloud when they're really just becoming more transparent. Another cost issue is that as we're moving GovCloud, for example, this enormous workhorse for the intelligence community to the cloud, we don't wanna just flip a switch one day and hope that it works. So there is going to be a period of dual run. There's going to be a period when we're paying for both systems and waiting until we're able to fully switch over. So that's a cost issue. Another challenge is the talent. Do we have the developers, the system administrators, the security practitioners, are they ready to be able to take on the new ways that we do things for cloud? Uh, but the opportunities far, far outweigh the challenges uh, for us in NSA. We are well along on this journey and we do not have a plan B. So uh, we're very <laughs> grateful to be partnering with everyone in this room, either now or in the future, uh, because that's our direction. We are, we are getting off-prem and we need uh, all of you as part of that journey. Thanks. So Roger, you've been a part of that journey as well, a partnership with DISA and the IC. Why don't yeah, we talk a exactly, about that? Doug. I mean, uh, so much of what we're doing, working closely in partnership with the IC and specifically with Linnea and her team, is again, how do we share information and work jointly in terms of assessing and understanding you know, the control capabilities that a cloud provider has put in place. What mitigations might we require, whether it's something specific to, you know, a top secret environment versus a secret environment versus an unclassified environment. So there's a lot of dialogue and synergy that we certainly have in that space. Uh, as I look at, you know, again, some of our drive for JWCC and the way that we have implemented the contract is making sure that DOD entities can actually utilize the cloud capabilities quickly. So that time that it takes to actually go from concept development to putting the requirements in to actually getting a task order in place and driving at those cloud capabilities is measured in days versus months. And, and that is a huge, huge uh, advantage for the department to be able to leverage. Uh, I think you know some of the other things that we've tried to do, especially as we talk about things like Secret Cloud, is the work with our DIB partners and industry at large. How do we enable the industry, in some cases there are systems that are going to be developed on an unclassified environment that will ultimately, and Doug, I think you had talked about this during your opening, where again, capabilities developed in unclassified environment to be pushed up to higher classifications. But there are cases of where we want and need capabilities to be developed in a, let's say, a secret environment. So how do we do that in a, an isolated fashion so that we can make sure that, again, those industry partners can leverage and take advantage of our secret cloud under government control, because again, recognizing the purpose of this, but again, having a industry, a, 
have the ability to leverage that cloud, bring those capabilities to the community in a classified fashion, and be able to, again, make that deployment. You know, so much of what industry has had to do in the past is develop capabilities in-house in some secret room that DCSA is then responsible for managing. We're worried about the information, you know, potentially getting into, you know, mishandled. You know, what do we do with that equipment as a program stands down? So again, bring, taking advantage of cloud capabilities and allowing industry to do development in a classified cloud has certainly been, I think, a game changer in it, and we're starting to take advantage of that. I think one of the capabilities that we have to look at, and you know, we've been having some conversations, is to work with our Five Eyes partners, right? You know, it was talked about yesterday that we don't go to battle alone, right? You know, it's all again about partnerships. So, how do we work with our Five Eyes community, and how do we make sure that you know the capabilities of cloud are there and available to? all of us when we need it, making sure that, again, they have, our Five Eyes partners have the capability to utilize their cloud capabilities, what can DOD potentially do. So a lot of work still in that space, but it's great to see, I think, the synergy that's coming across the community as a whole to try to figure out the how-to as opposed to the why not. And I think that's what really makes the difference in working with Linnea and Jennifer and her team. I think we see so much of the everybody partnering together and, and again, trying to work this as one team, which is fantastic in my opinion. Yeah, great points. And, and on the top of cloud uh, relates skill sets, new skill sets that we need to bring into the community. And during my fireside chat with Dr. Dixon yesterday, the PDD and I, we talked a lot about recruiting and retention and the types of things that we're doing to bring in uh, a workforce with different views, different skills than what we've traditionally had in the past. Uh, as part of DIA, one initiative that I helped start was our high school recruiting program. And uh, what I thought was very innovative of the time, uh, this was a few years back, um, turns out a lot of us are doing that. And uh, I engaged with one of the local school systems, met with their uh, school coordinator, and um, she said, oh, yeah, CIA's been doing this for years. Maybe you should talk to them. <laughs> so, Linnea, I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to you. <laughs> so some of the things that, that CIA is doing, uh, you know, in the recruitment, workforce. retention, workforce experience area. So hands down, I am emphatic about this. Uh, CIA's greatest asset will always be its people, right? We cannot do the mission without the people. And so regardless of how advanced the technology is, the shifting change of priorities, please know we are people focused and not just because of the mission, but because of really the people are what make the mission. We cannot do the work we do, provide the intelligence that we have without having the people in the workforce. So that is our, by far our strongest and, and most coveted asset, if you would. And so let's talk about the workforce. She talked about, uh, say, the, the uh, high school work study program the CIA has been doing for several years. NSA as well has a, a very robust work study program, but we are all about uh, recruit, train, and retain as kind of the motto internally in CIA. And I think it's important to also understand a lot of times we talk about them always big on mentioning there's five generations in the workforce right now, and so it is you know, roughly about 100 working years depending on when people are entering the workforce or maybe you know, looking to do second and third year careers. Uh, I think very proud and humble to say CIA also has a lot of mid-career, second or third career hires, meaning that we welcome folks to come in, whether it be from industry, academia, whatever the background experience, uh, and be able to share that from the defense or others and incorporate that background and to help make the intelligence better and help us to do our mission better, right? So I think that's very important to keep in mind. And that really kind of goes back and echoes to similar to what Dr. Dixon was talking about is a lot of times when people think about CIA or any of these agencies on the stage here, they think that only we're looking to recruit. And it's not that we aren't recruiting, you know, recent graduates, uh, high school or college, but we're also looking to really bring that experience and that background from industry, from the military, from wherever it may be, and actually help that to improve our mission. And so very focused and very big on, on the 
the training and recruitment aspect, I think another area and aspect to look at that is kind of the retooling, right? And so as we look at the change in technology, it's also important to understand that, of course, the skills, uh, access and to data and capabilities that we're doing now is very different than we were 20 years ago, even 10 or five years ago. And so that constant retraining, retooling, reskilling will also be a big area to keep up and keep abreast and really, again, decision advantage, if you would. Uh, I know Jennifer spoke some about talking about the cloud and where we are, and we both were chiming in on that. I think that also goes to now skills that people are learning are maybe very accessible via the internet or other aspects. And so uh, when CIA is looking at from a recruit, a train, and retain aspect, uh, I think we are very fortunate that we are able to recruit, but now the idea of you know how long will employees stay with us and also what's the pathway if someone wants to go and work in the industry and come back. Uh, I've been very fortunate to work with a few colleagues. I call them boomerangs because they maybe were in government and then went out and came back, right? And so uh, the previous uh, CIO, our Deputy uh, Associate Director of Digital Innovation, uh, Julianne Galina, was out in industry and she came back. And uh, even prior to she, the previous CIO, John Edwards, also worked in industry and then came back. And so I shared that as example examples to others and also encouragement of, you know, regardless of where you are in life and what's going on, know that, you know, CIA might be for you and we welcome you to apply and come join us on the mission because it's very rewarding and very thankful and humble to be a part of it. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good points. Mark, I know this has been and continues to be a big priority of NGA as well. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. So with uh, technology, you all heard of Moore's Law about technology, basically things double in about a two-year period. But again, Moore's Law is pretty much last century type uh, technology. I caution you, or have you look up something called Nevin's Law. Uh, Nevin is a quantum engineer, works for Google, and he came up with basically that uh, technology or is the, the amount of data stored in a bit of information geometrically doubles in this time period. And so uh, take a look at Nevin's Law. With technology changing so rapidly and so fast, we have got to be able to grow our workforce. We've got to develop our workforce and we've got to empower them so that they can um, adapt as technology goes on and that they can have a, a, a you know, solid learning associated with that. We've got to build a STEM workforce. And again, Dr. Dixon mentioned yesterday, we all have to be ambassadors for our community to be able to recruit people and be able to leverage their talents. And so we have got to be able to do that. We also have a high school internship program, probably not as old as CIAs or DIAs, <laughs> but uh, we're learning from you all. Uh, last year, we had probably 80 applicants for our program. We selected 23 to be part of our team. Uh, most were in my organization within cybersecurity as well as within software development. And so this year, uh, our program must have been a success. We had over 500 applicants for our program this year. And so very few positions, uh, but we're increasing that. And uh, again, we're investing the time and money to get these folks cleared and bring them on as uh, full members of our workforce uh, during their summer go back to school, when they go off and do their college, they have a much better idea of what they're going to do. And so uh, another area that we're really investing in training both our current workforce as well as our future workforce is cybersecurity. It has got to be something that we all focus on. Everything we do um, is pretty much related to cybersecurity. We were talking earlier today about, well, uh, you know, the budget for cybersecurity grows so much because everybody tags it, uh, whether it's buying a chair or buying a table <laughs> or, uh, um, or actually doing some cybersecurity, people tag that. Um, but our workforce has got to be cybersecurity aware. Everyone on our workforce has got to understand what it means when you click a link, when you uh, experience some phishing and things like that. Again, you've got to understand the ramifications of that. So we've got to make sure we uh, uh, train our workforce in that area. And, and last, lastly, I mentioned earlier about our common operations release environment and uh, really have a, a strong DevSecOps environment. We need to bring software engineers into our organization that understand how applications are built, how containerized applications are deployed, so that they can continue doing that. Um, 
Again, lastly, technical skills are really good and really needed, but we've also got to develop leadership skills, relationship skills. It's so important that we're able to convey information and relate to one another, and if they don't have those skills, uh, we're not going to have a viable workforce. And so we've got to have that ability to adapt and uh, build those relationships across the board. Um, lastly, uh, we retain our employees. Uh, again, we monitor what future skills we're going to need and make sure that we train our current workforce. We have things called competitive call where we basically fund uh, education opportunities for folks to go off to college to get advanced degrees. Uh, we offer loan repayment, scholarships, joint duty. Um, I know our organization has people attending or working in all of your organizations as part of our joint duty um, assignment program. and so. Again, thanks, Doug, for the question. I appreciate it. So final question, we've heard this from all of our speakers, particularly with regard to our partnership with industry and where we could use additional help. I mentioned earlier when we were talking about uh, speed and data and how we need to be able to operate anywhere in the world just like we do within our headquarters in Washington, D.C. Jimmy, let's start with you from a State Department perspective and the role you're filling as CIO and INR. Where do you need the most help from industry? Yeah, so uh, again, so thanks, Doug. Um, you know, I was given this chart of expanding the TSSI, SCI capabilities, right? I was given a charter to strengthen cybersecurity, but I also was given a charter to move into cloud adoption and cloud migration. And so uh, those three areas off the bat, we all continue to partner with industry on. And then leaning into um, how we can bring in our Five Eyes partners and how we can bring in more of the international communities where we need help. And, we're working towards a data strategy now, and so if folks are thinking data strategy, think about um, intelligence and diplomacy and how the data strategy fits in there. Think about emerging technologies. Uh, we need help uh, in that, those aspects as well, and we want to be able to take advantage of quantum computing. I want to be able to take a more, better advantage of geospatial intelligence, right, and that's an area that we can improve on from an uh, industry perspective, and so we can use help there. And then at the end of the day, at the end of the day, uh, we're um, recruiting, we're hiring, you know, we're retaining, <laughs> and so send folks to, okay, when Linnea is full and Mark's is full, then State Department's not a bad place to work as well. And so, you know, I would tell you, you know, you can't go wrong there. So uh, happy to have folks go back and forth between industry and, and government and, and bring the expertise uh, to the team. So thanks. Jennifer, you mentioned our, our partnerships with industry as, as we move, uh, or continue, I should say, through the cloud journey. What are some other areas from your perspective at NSA? Yeah, our partnership with industry is absolutely critical to NSA, and I think I can speak for the the whole IC. If we're going to be successful and if we're going to be able to address the complex challenges that we're facing right now. For NSA CIO, we are absolutely committed to a healthy industrial base, especially for small small businesses. That's a, a real focus of us. We need your innovative solutions. We need your unique capabilities. We need your talent, as we were talking about previously. Uh, We need your perspective. Um, Some of the things that uh, we're looking at, we're prioritizing being able to adopt or adapt things that already exist um, to maximum extent practicable. I had mentioned before, we've let contracts for some very large platforms, but that's just the beginning of the opportunities that are available to work with NSA. Um, I like something that General Kennedy had said yesterday, help us write better requirements, because sometimes we don't even know what's available, what's possible for us out there. In terms of specific things we're looking for from industry, uh, we're looking for things that can plug into our existing architecture, not so much the end-to-end solutions, but take into account what we have now, what we're building, and then how your unique solution is going to fit in that, including, again, things that we might not even know exist right now. It is a perfect window of opportunity as we're in the process of moving to the cloud, as we're moving off-prem. This is the time to help us take advantage of all these new capabilities that we're going to have. Otherwise, in terms of things we need industry to focus on, I would say, obviously, cybersecurity, but I feel like everyone's gotten that memo (laughs) so far. Uh, So I want to talk instead about a focus on IT accessibility. Um, So Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act requires all agencies to make all of their IT accessible to people with disabilities. There is an exception for national security systems, but at NSA and increasingly throughout the IC, we're saying we're not going to take that easy way out. We need to ensure that all of our systems are accessible to everybody. 
we are just talking about talent and how important it is that we get the best and the brightest and the best that this country has to offer. We cannot afford to just turn away a non-trivial proportion of the workforce because they may not see or hear or move the exact same way that some other people do. And so we're really focusing on ensuring that IT accessibility is built in from the beginning in our products and our services the same way that we've learned to do for uh, security. We need to do that for IT accessibility. At this conference last year, I had gone to a breakout session about uh, IT accessibility, and there was an officer from DIA, her name is Haley, so shout out if she's here, but she had an analogy that I'm now going to shamelessly steal, because I loved it so much. <laughs> she said about IT accessibility, to, if you're going to build uh, something and then try to make it accessible, it's like the way you make a chocolate chip cookie. Do you fully make a plain vanilla cookie? And then when it's done, you take a bag of chocolate chips and you try to figure out how to get them in there to make a chocolate chip cookie. Now, I'll confess that probably wouldn't stop me when it comes to a <laughs> chocolate chip cookie, but it's not the ideal. It's a suboptimal way to go about it. In the same way, we want to see the same way that we're doing for security, we want to see the IT accessibility baked in from the beginning. And increasingly, that's something that we're going to be looking for as we work with industry and as we consider what products to bring on board to adopt or to adapt. So look forward to working with you all on that. Uh, two other quick points that I want to make. First, um, not in terms of what we're looking for from industry, but one of the things we can offer you. I had spoken earlier about the National Manager for National Security Systems and a number of the services that we offer to the defense industrial base. So through our cybersecurity division at NSA, we make available NSA-managed cybersecurity services to help against a wide range of threats, and that's available free of cost to certain companies within the DIB. So please take advantage of everything that uh, NSA makes available to the defense industrial base. And if you're not working with us now, please, uh, you might be asking how you can do this. We are not in SAM, our contract opportunities. If you're interested, please be sure to register at our Acquisition Resource Center. You can find it at nsa.gov slash business, or please stop by our booth. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. And I'll also add in terms of uh, the point you make on accessibility of designing it in from the get-go. We heard from the 5 Eye panel yesterday and many of the speakers of looking at international activity or integration, I should say, at the very outset of a design rather than trying to tack it on at the end. So I would say that's another area in terms of help from industry of how do we incorporate international collaboration from the beginning as opposed to an afterthought. Yeah, 100%. Roger, you all are doing a, a ton with industry as well, especially on Zero Trust and GWCC. Can you expand on that a bit on where your priorities are? Sure. So one of the things that I think we really want to make sure that we can get from industry is, again, secure solutions. You know, so one of the things that DOD has invested in for, you know, probably 20 plus years is, you know, our concept of security technical implementation guides and making sure that when, you know, the vast DOD enterprise, you know, goes to install a capability or product, do we know how to actually implement that securely? And what we're seeing is a lot of companies are making that investment, you know, of secure by default, right? When you install the product right out of the box, it comes installed in a secure way, not in a, hey, here is the baseline default. It's up to you now to add the security to it, kind of along the lines that Jennifer was mentioning with the chocolate chip cookie. Um, so, you know, one of the things I would, you know, look for industry to help us with is making sure that we have those secure solutions by default. We've seen so much of industry partner with us in developing those security uh, guidance so that, again, all of our partners across the department, across industry and the IC and government at large use those guides so that they can make sure they're implementing things in a secure way. So, you know, really appreciate industry's help with that. And so think about, again, the, you know, the whole concept, and, and Lori got us all standing up shouting data, right? <laughs> How do we get data from the tools and capabilities that are being put forth to be able to bring that data in and merge that with other sources of data and help us form greater insights? So the ability to have APIs to pull data as opposed to trying to do you know, one-off custom solutions for everything that we are trying to accomplish uh, is immensely helpful. Um, costing, Honorable Sherman mentioned this this morning, the fact is that you know, when industry pits you know, 
the Army versus DISA versus the Navy versus NSA from a costing perspective, it's not doing any of us any good. So how do we, again, we need your help in getting to consistent costing and realizing that, again, we as a government are really trying to operate efficiently and effectively and, and pitting you know, one person's cost against another doesn't help us to be able to do that. And in fact, it slows us down from being able to support the warfighter. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, and I just want to echo back on top of Jennifer's point, is about Section 508 and the ability to support those folks uh, in the community who are challenged in some way. We, we've faced this challenge you know, numerous times and we have to come back to vendors or we even have to come back to our own people and say, you developed a solution, but it, you know, this is the problem with it. You aren't, aren't realizing putting yourself in the position of someone who can't see or someone who can't hear, et cetera. So anything that industry can do in helping give us solutions out of the box, giving us tools and, and that can readily make capabilities 508 compliant to be able to support our workforce at large is so, so important. So I just want to echo on top of that because it is such an important point. So again, appreciate everything that industry does for us. And uh, Doug, I'll pass it back to you. Well, thank you. And that is our time. Jennifer, Linnea, Jimmy, Roger, Mark, thank you very much. It's been great to, as, as we've said, see you in person and join each other on stage again this year Thank and look you. forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you all for joining us. And that will wrap it up. How did we do that? How did we end?